No, okay? just, I'm just kidding. Right. I don't need one. I don't need one. Hi, everyone. Hi. Welcome to Leveling Up with Saratias. He's going to teach us all about using metalwork to beautify your kit. His kit is amazing. And one of the really cool things about Atias is that he levels up his kit like every, well, every couple of years. And uh, I just want his cast offs, really. So, <laughs> but thank you, Atias, <laughs> for agreeing to do this. I'm really excited to see what you have planned for us. And uh, okay. plan. Anyway. Plan? I know you planned something. <laughs> I did. I did. I uh, I I started working on a project like a two or three days ago for this. I thought, hey, yeah, that's probably a good good idea if I had like an example to draw from or like show people some steps and all that. So uh, so yeah, I did it and finished it last night and it's okay. It'll work. Are you gonna show it to us? Uh, now. Well, I, it, or, is it part of the presentation? Like, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I could. I, there are better I can pictures wait. of it than what I got, but Woo. you did that one night. Uh, no, not one night. Maybe like okay. a, over a few days. Okay, cool. Just sort of gradually, I kind of, I kind of puttered my, puttered my ass around here, getting to it and and getting back to it, and because you know, uh, you know, I do have, I've got some other things been I'm working on not metal wise, but other, th other things. So, but it's like, okay, work a few hours on this, work a few more hours on it. Hey, I'm almost at this one point. I'm going to just keep working on it. So, yeah. you know, getting, getting to the groove. Uh, so should I start with like how I started or yes, please. getting into it? Okay. Um, well, I've been in the SEA since 19, late 1990. And uh, the first thing I went to was a demo at a local community college where I was about where I was starting to attend, right? And uh, I was lucky enough to let's see. I'll I'll share sh I'll share screen now. Excellent. Do you know it is? I saw like the first time I stepped out, and that was this guy. He was like one of the first things I saw when I got in the ICA. Um, and it's not so much Duke Torquil. I mean, you know, um, respect to him, uh, but it was what he was wearing, most specifically the thing on top of his head, that it's helmet. Super flashy. I think that was the very helmet that he was wearing that day. This this photo is like taken some years later. Um, so there was that example of metal work, and also Master Sir Alfred Wattweil's shiny, shiny, fluted German armor. Uh, who at the time was uh, was uh, Turkey Squire at the time, but anyway, so yeah, I saw this helmet and I was like, oh my god, that's that's one of the most gorgeous things I ever saw and and did not expect to see at this at this demo event. Um, of course, being new to the SEA, I didn't really know exactly what to expect, but this is like my first introduction to to metalwork in the SEA, this kind of thing, and um, and as uh do you know who made it he did didn't he no oh that is the work of duke Tor of uh duke torgol okay um uh, see if i can get this thing to work yeah and okay. at the, i guess at the around around the same time he made a series of of like helmets so cool time. and uh if you look if you've seen like uh either steer one of steer cars helmets or um, Duke Skeggy's, it's got that influence, or actually through Skeggy, that sort of direct lineage, because Skeggy used to be Torgal Squire. Well, both Skeggy and Steercar have Torgal helmets, don't they? Um, I think I'm not sure if, if Steercar Steercar may very well have a have a Torgal helm, but uh, he made a helm of his own. Um, back in those back in the, around those years that is very much in that style that uh what is it vendel yeah like style with the goggles and all that and uh but steer cars had instead of that kind of stuff he had his own i guess started metal work or close around that time he was starting metal work he had these nickel wyverns on his cheek plates and something else on the on his forehead but um so, so yeah, this was like Torgal, bam, 
Duke Torgal, um, was has had been a very early and huge influence on me. And I think not just on myself, but I don't know. I have no idea who else was making stuff like this back then with that kind of decoration on their stuff. No, I, I think he has been a huge influence, not just on the, the Viking culture in our kingdom, but on on people's armor standards. Like, you know, imitation yeah. is the sincerest form of flattery, right? And um, yeah, we're, we're all trying to be horrible. And he's yeah. he not only known within your kingdom, but he was known in other kingdoms because I knew his name early on as well in Artemisia. Well, technically eight and about there at the time. Yeah, so, so yeah, this right here, this is like, this is like a, a, a goal or like a, and I, actually a bunch of the stuff right here is the Pierce work in particular among those techniques. It's not that hard. And I'll show you with, with this example later on. But, uh, okay. Oh, it's like skipping on. But Ooh, anyway, so I know who's the work that was? <laughs> uh, only yeah, you know, I'll get back to it. I suppose I can get back to it now. No, no, do do your thing. Or well, all right. So, so uh, prettifying your armor with with metal. Um, let's see. Actually, let me go ahead and share again. There's like a bunch of stuff that is possible, right? You've got, you got this. I think it's Sir Matthias Myth uh, Bain's home. And I think Wren worked on it. Uh, I'm not sure if he did the, if he did all the brass work in the store, but it was also with like Ugo. Um, so there's there's that kind of decoration, which is I think some of it is etching, some of it is uh, chasing a um, bunch a bunch of like Master Sigmund stuff is you know the things that are that are cast, things that look like they're etched um on this helmet you've got all this other stuff a bunch of stuff again like cast etching uh this is a period helmet like a, mig a migration period helmet so if you want like well hey did they have any of this kind of stuff back in periods like well yes they did and here's just one of many examples um same kind of stuff viking vendel style helmet Torgal has like made his own version of this reproduction. Uh, this is a bit more fancy, but it's still like applying like metal stuff to your helmet. The, some of this is cast, I'm pretty sure. Some of it is, uh, the detail work is probably chasing. Of course, there's stones in it. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, again, there's another, another helmet with uh, some work on it. But um, I would say if, if you're gonna like start working on prettifying your helmet, one of the easiest things you can do is some chasing and some and some uh, pierce work. So tell me what's the difference between the two and what kind of tools do you need? Well, let me get back to my little share screen share. Okay, so Let's see, there's some tools. All right, well, that's a bit. That's a bit much. Actually, let me keep going back. All right, um, chasing is basically taking a metal tool and graving or impressing a, a thing into the surface, right? And this is like this is like chasing. This is like me taking the lining tool. Which is looks basically looks like a shiny a chisel with a very shiny little end on it, um, so that it's not it's because it's a it's an edge but it's not too sharp where it actually cuts into the metal. What you're trying to do is like you're trying to like flatten it, um, press into the metal with a with indentations with essentially, and this is like me using a little chisel tool to do a bunch of lines all over in it. We're just making line drawings. Okay. And um, so, yeah, you're just working it from one side for the most part and just making lines in it. Um, uh, piercing is where you're taking a saw and get there. A jeweler saw like this and 
yeah, you're just, you're cutting, you're making, you're making, making cutouts, you're making negative spaces in a, on the piece. Mm -hmm. And there, and of course the outline as well. Um, so yeah, you're just making, um, taking a flat sheet of metal and you're cutting out all these, all these spaces and all these out, outlines and, and silhouettes and whatnot. And a, a chasing tool or a lining tool you can use to make these lines in it, either lightly or deeply. I mean, this is like one pass with a, with a chasing tool. Wow. Can you see my pointer? Is that like? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. So yeah, you're just like, you're just taking this little chisel and you're just going tink, 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 and making all these lines. So how do you get your pattern on there? You can get your pattern on there and there's, there's a chasing tool I was using for this. You get your pattern on there. I, one more. So this is what I started with. Got a picture out of a book of something that looks like, hey, you know, I think I'd like that on this piece of armor. It looks doable. This one is like, you know, it's just like this simple thing. It's not repose. It's just, it, it is exactly what I, what I described to some extent. It is pierce work and it is some chasing. It is making lines. Actually, these pieces are more like they're, they're grave in, in an actual period. And that's where you're taking a, a sharp chisel thing and you are removing metal rather than just like pressing it in. So on this, you've got these kind of marks, these kind of lines. There's other pictures that look those are cool. Better. Yeah, this 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 is where you see more engraving. Where you're you're actually removing metal with this sharp edge or sharp with this point. And you're gradually going along and you're removing metal. That's where you got these these all the lines are like these channels, you know, right. sharp, shiny channels, rather than just like some lines have been pressed into it. Um, wait, what was the question? I just asked how you get your design on that and you showed me the light box and- Oh, right, um... right. So, so yeah, I, I chose a design that, that would fit in, that I thought would fit nicely inside this space with a little bit of, with a little bit of adjustment. Um, so I chose this uh, fighting camel, this vicious camel head. Nice. Uh, from, uh, from my period, actually. Um, from this burial called Filipovka, I believe. And uh, yeah, I thought, hey, you know what? If I take this guy right here and I make a double, if I make a copy of it, facing the other direction, I can come up with this right here. And that would, I think that would be attractive. I think it would fit nicely on my piece of metal and on my, you know, on my armor. So, um, so yeah, basically I like photocopied it off, uh, maybe adjusted the, the contrast or some of the other levels. So it, so the mark, so it stands out uh, and uh, drew and to make it even stand even more i might take a sharpie some very small fine tip sharpie and go over those lines so that when i put it onto uh when i want to put on onto a transparency with on the light board it kind of stands out more so i can like trace over it and um so there's did that and i took took the transparency and took some um so the Airmos contact spray glue and applied it to it and then took a chasing tool and started, um, you know, going along and I backed it with this very thick piece of steel that actually needs to have its face redressed. I mean, it's all, I've got made all so, so many marks on it um, by accident and also out of carelessness. Uh, so I, I need to like, reface it so it's nice and smooth and i was worked i worked on it with a uh, little chasing hammer a little rip chasing hammer but um if one were so inclined 
uh, one could just like use a very small ball peen hammer and go to it. Um, you don't have to have the fancy proper hammer. I mean, if this is like your first time out and you don't even know if you want to invest that many, that much in the tools and all that. And if you've already got a little ball peen hammer, it's like, okay, I already got my hammer. Now I just need my, my chasing tool. And you can either just go to Rio Grande and get one online. Um, for one lining tool, it's, I think there's like 12 bucks or something like that. Kind of depends on what you're willing to pay for. I have some really nice uh, chasing and, and uh, represent tools right now, thanks to Ugo making, making his stuff available. And um, a little bit more, bit more spendy, but it's worth it. I mean, you want good tools. You can't just take a, you know, just like your rate or normal piece of bar stock from the store and expect the tool to last forever because you haven't, you still have to like, you have to make the surface as you need it to be. And then ideally you want to, you want to be able to heat treat it so that it is really hard. <laughs> Otherwise uh, it'll start, you know, deform, the, the metal will start deforming. Even off, even on a soft metal, it will still start to deform after a long time, especially because on this, like I'm, you know, I'm uh, doing it against a steel block. So anyway, so yeah, you want, you want decent tools, which a lining tool like that, you can get for not, for not very much money. Um, so, so that's basically all you need for chasing is just, if you just want to make lines, that's pretty much all you need right there. A uh, jeweler saw and a key. Let's see, let me get to the thing that it's on right there. That's this thing right here is called a key. And this one is like homemade. And this, of course, this is like a regular C clamp that lots of people have in their shop. Um, even if they're not professional metal workers, they may have something that's been handed down to them from their dad or something like that. I think which of the cases, this is the case for me. Um, so yeah, the amongst this, the only special specialty tool on this set is the jewelry saw and the blades. You can get kits where you can get the blades and the saw, the blades, and the key that has its own little clamp. Um, but those are often very small. So if you want like a larger key so you can do larger work, then you can cut one of these out on your own. Is, you, is your key just that. like laminated plywood? Yeah, that one is just, yeah, that one's like a, uh, it's not, I'm not sure it's plywood, it's a laminated something. Okay. But yeah, you can use laminated plywood. All it has to do is, is have that shape that allows you to go in, out, you can turn your piece around and adjust it and keep working on it. Cool. Um, so it's easiest to work these things flat. Uh, if it's curved, it, which you may have to do sometimes. It's a little bit more tricky, but you'll, after a while, you'll get used to how to, how to hold your, your jeweler saw, how to make it move and not bust the blade as much. <laughs> if you have a curved piece, like you're doing your helmet and it needs to be a curved piece, do you curve it before you, you pierce work it or do you curve it after? Uh, the, the, Kind of depends on if it's a if it's a simple curve or if it's a compound curve, like a dome. Um, this guy right here, I pierced it first, and then because that wasn't too much of a compound curve, it wasn't too steep. I decided to like you know um, to uh, dish it afterward when after it's mostly done. Um, the, the, the trick in making something that is pierced work and that is cut out is that uh, your design may be complex enough to where when you do get to that point where you want to like dish it and you want to, so it conforms to that surface. If, uh, if the, the piece is too complex and you have too many disconnected pieces of metal, they will deform and separate from each other. Um, so that, that makes things, that can make things a little bit difficult. Okay. So I guess a strategy would be to do as much as you can, cut out as much as you can flat and uh, 
then dish it and then do the finishing cuts so that the metal is still like more or less together and they're not I'll like you one more question i feel like i'm throwing you off with my questions but okay uh, it looked like when you showed it before that you had drilled holes to make it easier to do the pierce work. Is that right? Or was I misinterpreting the, the photo? Uh, well, in order to get to those spaces, you have to drill little holes. Okay. So your blade can go in there. Okay. Uh, Cause you can't come at it from the outside cause there's you know stuff in the way. So if I want to do, if I want to make a, uh, a negative space inside, like in here or in there, I have to disconnect the top of the, the blade, stick it through a hole that I've drilled into that space and then cut out the space. So um, Jed asks um, that you use the key that way for pierce work, but how about chasing? For chasing, let's see. Um, At least I think that's what he's asking. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's, that's yeah, I was gonna, get to this. I'm sorry. We're no, 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 it's, it's fine. It's fine. I like what we're doing. Um, chasing and for a flat piece, small piece like this, oh. I was fine to sort of letting it just be honest on that steel plate. Okay. I can either hold it with a small clamp that got off to the side or I, or just with uh, something that that'll kind of keep it in place. Could be something is like, just like the butt of my of my palm but ideally you want you don't want to have to do that you want to like keep it clamped down in some way one way to do this and the easy way to do this is to um for chasing and repose because they're both they're both like interweave and in, in some techniques why is this doing this automatically uh is putting it on pitch okay and so, no go ahead uh and course that's another thing that you have to sort of add to your expenses as far as what you're willing to you know pay for um to get to get the work that you want to get done um so for something simple like that yeah i'm fine with just like clamping it down flat and doing the chase work there i can even go for another pass on such a surface um actually i could even like take this and i feel like i could like you know what i i want to make these lines a little bit more defined I think I'll go over it again because the metal I've got right here is pretty stout. It's actually a really stout gauge of, of steel. Um, I feel confident I can do that without much problems. So, so I did misinterpret his, his question, but um, you answered my question. So that's great. But he's wondering, um, do you bend, do you dish before you chase or after you chase? Kind of depends on what you're comfortable with. Okay. Um, let's see for something that's, uh, okay. So my, let's see if I can get there. Where is my, I mean, easy way to do this backward thing. This is my first time working with uh, PowerPoint in this way. So it's like, you know, be patient. Um, the arrows on your keyboard don't work. Let me try. Oh, so it does. Great. Thank you. I'm a lawyer. I, I use PowerPoint all the time. So you are awesome. Okay, this guy right here, I decided to uh, to dish that first, and then chase it. But because I have pitch, and a pitch pot or some other vessel that can hold the pitch, it's easier for me to do that. If you aren't willing to spend the money for say red pitch for repose and chase and chasing and all that, um, then I would say. Do it flat, dish it afterward. None of this is pierced, so it'll be fine. However, the advantage of working on something like pitch is that I've already got it on that curved surface. I'm working it in one way, um, and the pitch is allowing it to deform the parts around those lines so that it kind of gives it a, uh, a kind of relief to it where you, you, you know, get, it actually allows for like some shadows and stuff like that around the lines and the middle bend so it gets like curves to it uh, around those lines so in, rather than just like like this it's more like this so i have a totally newbie question what do sure. you mean by pitch 
Uh, pitch is most often used in like uh, repose and chasing, and it's actually. You have a really cool. Ah, this is someone who's uh, who's working on red pitch, and there are different colors of pitch for doing this work. It's uh, this is stuff that you heat up so you can place that so it becomes soft, and then you place your work into it, and then when it when the when the pitch cools, it firms up. And so it uh, kind of holds it in its shape. It holds it, it, it can hold it in that, in that, it can grip. Well, you have to sort of like pull some of the edge, some of the pitch over around the edges a little bit, or in some other way, get it to adhere, uh, give it, give the pitch more of a surface to grip onto, but it'll hold it in place for the most part. And uh, as, opposed, as opposed to like that steel plate, the pitch will give. So it'll, it'll be firm, it'll be a firm surface, but it will also give to what you're doing to it. Okay. So it allows you to push the metal in, push the metal around on it and yet keep it in place. So you get much more of a 3D effect. Yeah. So is pitch also something you can get at Rio Grande? Oh yeah. You can get a lot from Rio Grande. And they're not the only seller of, of things I've found out. There's another place called uh, Guess Wine, G E S S W E I N. Um, so they have competitors, but I think a lot of people go to go to Rio Grande. Cool. Um, they're fine. They got tools. They got what you need. May sometimes it may seem a little bit expensive. Sometimes it's worth the expense. Um, it just kind of depends. But uh, pitch, I think for two pounds, uh, let's see. Jed will have to like correct me on this because he he bought it most recently. You get it in these in these two pound bricks, and I think you can get two of those two pound bricks for ninety dollars. So about forty five dollars for a for a two pound brick of this stuff. And that's the red pitch. There are other there are other colors that have uh, different qualities to them. Uh, the one I started out with was black pitch and, uh, I got turned on to the red pitch cause I had, I had heard from friends that it's a, it doesn't powder as much because when you're working the, when you're working on pitch, it is giving, but it is also like crumbling a little bit too, and can tend to, um, fracture and even pop off, uh, surprise or just break, um, but apparently uh, the red pitch doesn't turn to a powder as easily as the black pitch does. Uh, I think there's another picture here where it's, yeah, I and mean, this one, you have like this green pitch, which I haven't tried out. And I also saw another one that has uh, um, gray pitch. Um, yeah, so. I suppose I can invest more money into into doing all this and trying out all these different pitches. I'm sure Master Ugo or or uh, Master Steer Car, as Grace would uh, have their own opinions on what they what they do. Actually, Steer Car has made his own pitch, I believe. He's actually gone over to Italy or no Spain, and uh, learned under some masters and and uh, has had to make his own pitch. Either because they made him because he wanted to. I, I wouldn't be surprised if he just wanted to, because the guy is so, you know, he's, he's got such a curious mind. Yeah. He wants to know all the things. Very cool. So um, Jed put a link in the comments for a good price for pitch and, and that they have bowls. So you always put your pitch in a bowl? Not always. I mean, they, the bowl is great. I mean, it's designed specifically for the purpose of, of holding the pitch, and it and it the right about the, about the right kind of dish shape, and it's also massive. It's it got mass to it. It's not just like you know a, a you know your Tupperware bowl or or a stainless steel bowl. It has some weight to it, so that helps to keep the work stable, and and um, not vibrate or anything like that. You want to work, you want to work your uh, your piece on something that's stable and that will not move and that where you can the the uh, the power of the your blow of your little hammer blows and taps and all that goes to the work and does and isn't necess unnecessarily dispersed 
by a surface that's shaky. Okay. Um, so yeah, usually the kit comes with the bowl. It comes with a, a little rubber um, support that goes underneath the bowl. But um, because those pitch bowls are only so big, and you, I'm sure you can get bigger ones, uh, but I start off with the one pitch bowl that's only about like, you know, that big. Uh, but for something like, where is it? So much coolness. This guy, I needed something bigger. So um, I got, you know, I made my own little container out of some wood. Makes me, makes me made a shallow little tr uh, box tray and poured my um, pitch into that. And it's large enough to where it accommodates that kind of space. I've also used a, an old cast iron skillet. Um, what else have I used? Yeah, those, those kind of things. Um, the cast iron skillet is good because it also, like the pitch pole, is, it's got mass to it. It's got weight. So it's not going to shift too much. And I usually have a shot bag that I place those things onto either to give myself just a little bit more height and or to just you know give it that much more of a mass to rest on and I can like shift it and tilt it in ways that I like very cool it's all very helpful but um I was going to ask the same question that somebody just asked what what's the best way to um heat your pitch and best ways to remove pitch stuck to the back of your piece. Is that Jet again? No, that's uh, Tang A Knob Gongs. Okay, okay. So I was trying to like, well, <laughs> uh, actually one of the, when I first started using a uh, pitch, it was with a torch. Yeah, you know, just a little, you know, a little propane torch. And, but then I found out later on that a, a heat gun works better or maybe it's not as volatile. <laughs> do, you, do you use the heat gun to um, to heat treat the metal too? I was gonna ask if you use the same kind of thing. No, use a no. torch okay. Okay. To, to anneal the metal. Okay. Um, yeah, I use, I use a torch and just heat it up red, let it cool. And to remove the pitch uh, for a while, I was using something like a, the torch or the heat gun to slowly, you know, melt away the pitch and try to get it to drip away. Um, I don't do that anymore. I, 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 uh, I ventilate my area. I, I use a torch <laughs> and basically just burn it away. Um, I was, I was, you know, either way, you're, you are losing the pitch that is in there. Either because you're wiping it out, you find you like I have to get a paper towel to wipe it out, or um, <clears throat> or you're bringing it away. Either way, you you will lose oh, pitch over time. Really? Only very in, very very in small amounts. And the other reason why I started using the torch, not just because it made it easier to just like make it quicker to just burn it away. Um, also, out of the little crevices that a little paper towel won't reach. Um, I also started using the torch on that because, well, I'm I'm going to have to anneal the the piece the the metal anyway again, because you can only work it so far to where the you start you start to make the metal brittle in those areas that you've worked it. But you so if you want to keep working on it, you need to soften it again. You need to anneal it again. So I have found that yeah, more often than not, what I'm doing when I take a piece off the pitch is I'm just take a torch, burn the pitch away, and then anneal it, like right after. And then just, you know, brush off the, the ashes from the pitch. So Susanna wants to know what you made your shot bag out of. See, Ludwiga had a, had a Folgers uh, coffee can of shot, I think from like shotgun shot. And, um, uh, yeah, I just I just made a, a shot bag using that as the contents. Okay. And it's lasted me for a very long time. I need to actually remake it because 
it's worn through the leather in a few places. So I got these little holes I've had to patch up with duct tape. But yeah, I used, um, and I would suggest, you know, I guess just from my experience, some other thing like sand might be better for the contents of a shot bag, but what is called a shot bag. So this shot just makes sense to me. So how big is worked. your shot bag? What? How big is your shot bag? It's about that big. And about, probably about that thick on average. Cool. Sorry, these are not necessarily precise measurements. I think it gives her a good idea, so. Okay. Um, but as far as decorating metals con is concerned, uh, yeah, one of, uh, there's amongst the simplest things, simplest techniques you can, you can use for decorating your metal for doing all that is, one is piercing, really dirt, simple and easy. Another one is chasing. With those tools, it starts getting a little, you're putting in a, just a little bit more investment into it. Repose um, gets you more expensive because now you're, you're putting stuff into pitch, you're getting more, you're getting better and more variety of, of chasing tools and repose tools. Um, so you can make all those all those shapes, but you can't do with just a little liner tool. If you wanna actually like push metal around and all that, you're gonna to have to spend a little bit of money and start um, investing it in some, in some tools or make your own. There are tutorials for that out there for, um, for heat treating uh, tool steel. I know that you have a picture in here of a sheet. Um, what, if, if somebody's brand new to this, what um, gauge of sheet should they buy? Uh, let's see. That sheet right there is what I got from Park Rose Hardware last week. And it's uh, six by 12. And I think that was $13. I've got some prices here. Yeah, that guy and it's, no, it was, no, it was $12. It was, it was $11.99 from Park Rose Hardware. And that is 22 gauge brass. And, um, and as far as the variety of metals is, is concerned, brass, copper, uh, nickel is another, uh, if you want something that looks silvery, but will not tarnish, <laughs> uh, nickel silver is good. Um, brass, copper, both of those guys oxidize, so you get a patina on them. But if, you're, but if you like patinas, if you like discolorations of, of those metals, either on purpose or you know whatever, um, patinas can be cool. I mean, let's see where's um, sorry, I want to weird you out. Okay, so this is like one of the simplest things that you can make. You know, just just a simple silhouette, and that's the background metal steel that I that I blue uh, gun blued. Uh, I need, as you can see, I've let, kind of let this go. So I it may need, want to polish it up. And this is a cop, piece of copper that I cut into the, the wave pattern. And it's held on with uh, copper rivets, actually copper nails. Uh, those are slate nails is what they'd be called at, the, at their hardware store. They're not the ribbed things. They're not the ribbed uh, copper nails. They're slate nails. So the shank is is smooth and straight doesn't have any like indentations on it um so yeah this is like the simplest piece of decoration you could possibly do it's a simple pattern um that's been pierced not too carefully as, as you can see i was kind of in a rush to get it ready for <laughs> crying i was i'm kind of impatient with the work with my work sometimes um but and yet I like the patina, the discoloration that this thing has. I like having, sometimes I like having pieces of metal that are decorative and yet um, for me have their own kind of attractive character and how they discolor. Um, bronze is also great for that. At least and I think. You pointed out like how it's not perfect, but I, 
I, I think that's important for people to know that this is really accessible for them because this is actually part of your belt, right? Like your kidney belt. And you have a, multiple of these on a belt and you can't tell while you're on the field that there's yeah. anything imperfect about it all. It just looks really cool. It's, it's part of my Barney armor, yeah. So, yeah. There's nothing wrong, and there's nothing wrong with having simple that's on the field. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can imagine, uh, one of the reasons why I kind of like this is I, I do like to imagine that a uh, veteran of the, of the wars in whatever period doesn't necessarily keep all of his kit shiny because he doesn't really have time for that. He's been busy killing people or or defending the realm or you know he's just tired and he did, can't afford and his his squares may not be all that you know whatever um it's got it, it, it i think it gives the idea of being used of history of the wearer having history um sometimes i i, I mean it is nice to have shiny shiny stuff out on the field um but in a way, it kind of reminds me of, of something that has been purchased but has hardly ever been used. Or is made simply to be shiny rather than functional. Um, if, any, if any of that makes sense. I, I love the patina on the metal because I think it gives it depth and character. Yeah. 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 Um, Actually, there's that. Where is? See, that's that helmet right there is not all shiny, shiny. It's, yeah, I I love the I love the colors of, of uh, I think that's probably bronze that he's got on there. It looks and like you can shine really you can shine that up to a mirror to a mirror finish, um, but in a way it it doesn't make it that much more attractive. This has a, uh, here's a bit of uh, Sigmund's work. This also could be shiny, shiny, shiny. And yet, it, and yet he chose specifically to not make it be. It's so beautiful. <laughs> That's like yeah, the truly. beautiful helmet. The girl on that is obscenely gorgeous. I forget who, the, who that belongs to. That's Phelan's. Oh. Is it? Oh, right. Phelan's. Familiar. Yeah. I covet it. So yeah, uh, shiny shiny isn't isn't necessarily always nice. Although it can cover a certain amount of, if you're kind of uh, self conscious about about some of your work, uh, the buffing wheel can kind of make you feel better because it makes your thing shiny. <laughs> um, but you know, it kind of depends on the individual what they want. If they want that gleaming thing out there, that's cool. That's fine. If someone likes her stuff all kind of war torn and they look like a grizzled veteran of, of, of old, then that's that's got its attraction for me too. And uh, and yeah, so the for, so for the starter going out there and saying, you know, I want to make I want to make my own stuff, or at least I want to give it a try. Do it. Go ahead and go and try it, and, and uh, be okay with with that with that work being what it is. I mean, you made it. You made your own stuff. And you may decide from then on to make more stuff. And, and your sense of taste may tell you, you know what, that's, that's not as good as it could be. I could probably make it better. And so hopefully you'll give it another shot. So, yeah. Can you um, take us through some of the pictures? I'm just gonna show you this guy right here, that, that, that thing I've got on my breastplate. Mm -hmm. the the uh i'd like to think of it as a as a either a lion or a wolf a uh past squire of mine once asked me if it was a shrimp <laughs> 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 i wanted to hit him but oh well past squire. <laughs> <laughs> no he's fine he's a good guy oh, um so yeah, this, this piece is made out of bronze. And that's like one of the first things I wanted to try to make. And I used a, a um, jewelry saw and broke so many blades doing, because 
A, it's so thick. Right. And B, I didn't really know what, you know, what I was doing yet. Um, but yeah, that's, I think that is like, it's not quarter of inch thick. It's like a, maybe like at least an eighth of an inch thick. And so what's the best metal to start with then? Copper is so soft and easy. It's a little bit more expensive than brass, but copper is like, uh, it's a great starter metal um, <clears throat> for pretty much everything. I mean, piercing, repose, chasing, it's, it's a wonderfully really soft, forgiving metal. You still have to, well, I say forgiving, but you still have, it will still like break through on you. Um, but yeah, um, copper is really good. From then on, I'd probably go brass, um, which is a bit more rigid. Um, and nickel silver is cool. It's shiny. It looks like either stainless steel or silver. If you, if you want, if you want to think that, uh, it is less forgiving and it, you work hard in it really fast. Um, God, I haven't, I haven't tried to, I'm not even sure you can anneal uh, nickel silver that well. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not very forgiving. So I would like to do like, you know, just simple kind of patterns with it. Or, you know, if you feel confident, more go for more complex. But yeah, it is not copper. It is not brass. Um, steel, it would be like, you know, I, I, I don't even, I have no idea how much uh, patience Ugo has. He's got to have so much to work to represent steel. It's got to be just insane. Yeah. And uh, of course, uh, silver, just regular silver. Uh, that's, that's fun if you want to work up to that. So, but yeah, copper is like the simplest metal to work with. Uh, this plate is bronze. Bronze is kind of, actually kind of, you can't just, I mean, yeah, it's harder to find. You have to go, you really have to search and go somewhere to get some for yourself. Well, well of course, online sources make it, make it far easier. I can't remember how much more expensive it might be, um, but it is like, a, like brass, it's a copper alloy. So um, I've, I've worked with a little bit of, tried to represent a little bit of uh, bronze and it's a bit stouter than, than uh, brass. Um, nickel silver is still less forgiving than bronze, but yeah. Will, will something that you do in copper hold up on your armor? Uh, provided it's got a good backing, it'll hold up, hold up as well as anything else. Okay. Um, I would not rely, I mean, the, the, this guy has been bent up a little bit over time. I've had to sort of re-bend it back into shape. Um, but if I wanted something to like, you know, really keep its form, I'd give it a good backing of a nice stout metal like steel and not rely upon either copper or brass or even really bronze um, just by themselves. Maybe bronze if it's thick enough. I don't know. Um, yeah, I would back it with something like steel. So I how did you it on its own. I would not I would not put it on to if I was gonna put it on something like on like plastic covered with leather and do it over that, which I've considered. Um, I, I would not be surprised if it gets deformed and starts looking kind of beat up <laughs> and crinkly. So you, you talked about how you used um, those nails to attach the plates to your body armor. How did you attach the wolf? And then also another question, um, Zoe would like to know if you fill the back of your repose with something if you're putting it on your armor. To the first question, this guy right here, I soldered some uh, loops onto the back of it so I could you know put it through the leather and then use the loops to you know fix it to the back to that leather um, that's why this thing has no rivets on it of course you can also do as say uh, I've seen Torfin do with some of his like you know bronze buckles he will um, uh, solder on copper rivets onto the backs so that you can 
affix them to the to like straps, leather and all that. Uh, let's see the second question. Right, the repose. Okay, this guy right here has like is it's curved. It's like got a compound curve, but it's got it's got steel against it, and it's just chased, so it's not that high of a relief. This is like a low relief kind of repose where I worked it both from the top and from the back to make it stand out. So that's where that's how you get those high reliefs is that you're working in not just from one surface, but also from the other as well. So you're kind of pushing the metal back and forth until it's, you know, the, 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 kind, the, the result that you want. I decided to back this guy with, um, damn it, what's it called? Uh, went right out of my head. It's a, it's a putty that you can find. And it looks like lo the brand is like Loctite. Sorry, <laughs> phone's ringing. Sure. Sounds like an old school, like 1980s phone, <laughs> like a real phone. Well, actually, yeah, I, I've got that. I've got an old school, I've got a rotary really? phone over here. I do. Awesome, awesome, okay. Um, so this guy is like backed with- Oh, she's saying it's epoxy putty. Is that right? Um, no. Who's saying that? Well, somebody's saying, is that what you're saying? Epoxy putty? Um, let's see. Oh, sorry. This is backed with an epoxy putty. OK. Uh, this is more like a JB Weld. OK. So it, yeah, it's, it's essentially the same thing. The, the materials are, are different, but yeah, they still have the same, are still serving the same purpose of giving something solid to back the metal with. So it does. So when it get, does get hit, it doesn't deform. So yes. would you just sort of like put the epoxy on the back like butter and then rivet it down? Um, well, I wait. Oh. I waited for it to cure a bit. Okay. But yeah, I just like uh, for this one. Yeah, I just like let. I just fixed my epo my little epoxy and poured it in and and encourage it to go into into its uh into the different areas where you know that that i needed it to be supported in and then let it set hopefully it's going to be like levelish when it's done and not overspilling or anything like that and then I just let it sit and then we'll, and then just stitch it to my to my thing um this guy i'd never worked with uh with that stuff before that is the um the JB Weld stuff. So I work with that with some gloves, of course, because I don't want that, really don't want to get stuff on my hands that I don't want to get on my hands or my skin. And uh, yeah, just wait for it to, to set up according to its directions and make sure it's, you know, kind of like it, that also it's not bulging out in area, any areas I don't want it to. And then, yeah, I rivet it onto the, to the piece. So can I ask another random question? Sure. Um, when you're doing pierce work, um, do you sand um, after you do the cut work? Like, do you, so that the edges are smooth or like how yeah. much finish work do you have to do? Um, so uh, with chasing and with the piercing, you're, you're, you're gonna end up with burrs. And also with, with drilling holes for rivets and all that, you're gonna end up with birds, so, burrs. So yeah, in this picture, you can probably see that I've got some, some marks on the, on, the, on the face of it where you can see that I've like taken some sandpaper or, or even like a file and just like, okay, I have to take off these burrs. I have to make it nice and smooth or as smooth as I can. And, uh, and hope, but hopefully with, with mark with not having any marks in that work that is gonna is that it's not intentional like you know uh taking a a file and just like slipping and dragging it across the surface and now i've got a huge ass gouge on it <laughs> that i that'll be really hard for me to get out uh so yeah whatever cleanup work you're gonna have to do on that you want to make sure it's it is what you want and uh, not something unintentional. So for this guy, I took a file to like 
the edges to take off burrs. And also because the saws leave saw marks um, on those areas, that's you take like needle files. I've got a, like a collection of them right here. Oh, cool. That's not all the ones I've got either. Um, to get to those little surfaces and even on the insides in some of these areas and to take off the burrs and whatnot. I do that, try to do that carefully. I'll probably work with sandpaper as I did with this one. And uh, yeah, just try to get off all those burrs because you don't want those around. Particularly with like, um, I mean, not, there are reasons for this. One is that if you run your hand across it, it can cut you. These burrs can cut you still. Uh, they're, little, they're more than just little annoyances. They can, you know, you want to file all your work as much as you can and clean them up. And as far as the drill holes are concerned for putting rivets in, you know, you've, you've, I'm sure you've done it. You like drill a hole and you've got like this big ass burr on the, on the other end. And that can, and on, and on both surfaces too, both the, the going in and on the opposite side. So if you want to have your rivet to be flush, then you need to get rid of that burr. And on the back side, the burrs, yeah, you want to get rid of those too. You want a nice clean um, peening job on the back. Cool. And the, the rivets themselves, let's see, where have I got them? Got one picture of them. Um, hmm, I guess not. Thought I did. Escutcheon pins are what I aim for or what I want to find. Um, you can get rivet rivets and they, they exist out there. The kind of rivets that you want. Um, but <clears throat> what I found very useful is just getting some solid brass escutcheon pins. Sure, I've got that picture. Where are you? Sorry, probably ain't gonna like give someone a fit or something. <laughs> right, I put it at the end because that's when you rivet them on. These guys right here. And um, my experience with uh, with these rivets is that if you want to keep that dome shape, you're gonna have to make something. The whatever it is you're gonna be uh, using as your backing to pin that over should have that shape or accommodate that shape. Otherwise, it's going to um, let's see flatten out the dome on, on, on a portion of it, especially if you decide you want to anneal those rivets so that you can pin them over better. Um, you'll notice the difference between some of these rivets. The, this guy right here and this guy right here, those are not annealed. And they, st and they, they have a little bit of, uh, of the top surfaces flattened out. But whereas these guys right here are ones that I annealed. And they really just like <laughs> squashed. So that's a little, um, hopefully a couple of little helpful notes. Escutcheon pins at a hardware store. Make sure they're solid brass and not plated. Um, because plated just means they're going over, they're, they're steel, but they've been, they've give, been given a veneer of, of uh, brass. And when that's when that when you mush that when it's gone it'll rust in the steel rust way and if, uh, rather than just patina um here's another little note uh i don't have a proper buffing wheel or buffing machine <laughs> this is a grinder that i've attached a buffing wheel <laughs> to and I've, I've used this for years and years and years. And I keep on telling myself I want to cut away this, this uh, shielding on the outside <clears throat> or this um, casing so I can take full advantage of all the, of the full range of the wheel itself, which is what buffing, wheel, buffing machines have. They don't have these guards. They just have the, I believe they just have the rods that like stick all out. And so you can, you're not, imp you're not impeded by these guards, uh, top or bottom. But I'm not a prof I'm not a professional uh, armor jeweler maker. This has been working for me so far. Um, I may level up. It may not in that respect. <laughs> I, 
I like that, you know, you, you made something work for yourself, you know, you, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I sometimes I feel like I do have like a hard time spending money, and that's then that's not been really to my benefit. But I have learned that to adapt myself sometimes. There is something to be said about um, quality tools, but yes, absolutely. Also you showing that you've you've made this a buff a buffing wheel. Um, out of a grinder shows people that it can be accessible and you can be creative and make your tools too if you don't want to spend the money. Yeah. Especially if you're just starting out. Yeah. Right. And you may find that it's like, you know what? I want to keep doing the more and more of this. I want to get better and better. I am going to spend the quality, the the, the money on the, on the quality tools. Um, yeah, I would absolutely, I would, if you've got the means, I would absolutely encourage it. So you had um, some pictures of some dishing stumps in here, but we didn't talk about what you use them for. Right. Okay. Dishing stump. It's just a piece, <laughs> it's just a section of wood of someone's tree. Um, this one is, is getting old, as you can see. Oh, come on, where'd you go? Oh. No, not now. I don't want dictation. There's the wrong <laughs> button. Uh, as you can see, I, there's so many drill holes. Um, it's got one, I made one main dish right here. There's a couple of smaller ones off to the side. Um, nowadays, if I want to dish a clean, a smooth, clean surface that I don't want to mark into that dishing stump, I would lay down like a piece of soft leather of scrap leather to do that with. Because um, marks, even uh, even straight pieces of metal and all here in, in this will transfer to your metal. Um, and that's why you see, and that also applies to, you know, like hammer surfaces and uh, chasing and repose tool surfaces, why those guys are so, so shiny and smooth. Where are we? Uh, it's because they need to be that way because otherwise you are transferring whatever defect is on that surface to the metal. So if you don't want those defects, you, you need, that's why all these guys are like mirror finish. Not just because of the shape, but also because um, you want a nice clean surface to work with. And that's why I also need to, again, redress that steel plate that I've got so it's so I'm not transferring whatever is on that surface to the metal I'm working on. So uh, this is a nice tool to have. It's a nice gauge. So you know what kind of thickness of metal you're working with. I mean, you can you can you know look at your at your sheet and it's like guesstimate. Well, yeah, that's about the kind of thickness I want. Uh, but it's really nice to have this kind of gauge around anyway, just so you know uh, what you're dealing with. Let's see, there's a piece of metal. This is me stealing from the past, <laughs> which we do so much of, and that's fine. It's totally fine, I think. Um, so yeah, the the... <clears throat> The pattern for this guy, or, or actually the yeah, the work for this, is out of that Golden Deer Eurasia book, and uh, and it's got so much wonderful, beautiful stuff in it that applies directly to to you know this thing that I've been I you know the piece of work I've been showing in decorating metal and all that. Um, and it's such just such beautiful work, and. Uh, I want something I want to be able to do is is know that aesthetic well enough to create original art um, rather than just copying it from a book and, <laughs> and directly transferring it as beautiful as, as this stuff is it's like you know I wonder if I can like make something of my own that is in that style um, and yet is is something I've created is, is your shrimp not that? My shrimp is not that. Okay. 
I stole that. I stole that from a um, a uh, artifact from, a, from another book, and I think the original is like you know, like that big. But I liked it so much. Like God, God that's really that's really cool. It is I cool. want a shrimp like that in full size. <laughs> I've never thought it looked like a shrimp. I always thought it was a dog. I know he was just doing it. He was just saying that to to, to get me. <laughs> So, um, let's see. So, can I ask one more question? I'm sorry. Like, I, ask me any question you want. I think okay. I've, I think um, we've covered most of what I wanted to cover anyway. So, do you also use um, the the buffing thing to get the the remnants of the paper off? Nope, I burned that off too. Burn it off. Okay. <laughs> Uh, the, yeah, I burned off the paper and the adhesive because otherwise what I've done in the past or what I've been taught to do in the past was, okay, so you've transferred your design. Now you want to take off that, you know, the scraps of paper and the glue underneath. So you're going to like take some of this rag that's got mineral spirits in it. You're going to like keep working and keep rubbing it off and, and uh, usually with like a paper towel, which is really <laughs> terrible because it just like comes right apart, right? Um, and I realized, you know, if I just ventilate my area, I just like want to burn this stuff off, just get rid of it. Also, um, you know, again, annealing the re-annealing the metal, making it soft again. Because, you know, working with those chasing lines and all that, I work hardened it a little bit. Um, so I may as well just use that and take it off because I don't think that piece was annealed in the first place. Uh, a lot of sheet metal comes to you like it's it should be already kind of soft on the soft side um but when you when you have something in the old you can really tell that oh wow yeah this is really soft now of course when you want to heat it up so much where you're going to melt it or essentially burn it but so yeah um with this uh i decided not to waste any time with the mineral spirits so I just just get rid of it just burn it off and then just take a, a little um, uh, brush to it, you know, a little bristle br uh, wire brush and just get rid of it. Um, you want to quickly take you through the steps of coming up with this? Yes, please. All right. So again, start with the pattern, uh, did a, you know, transfer it onto some transparency paper so that I could glue it on to the, onto the metal. And this is just a piece of metal that I, that I had in my store, as it were, that seemed to be about the right size and about, about the right thickness. This is actually pretty thick, probably thicker than I needed it to be. Then again, maybe not. I don't know, it's probably about like 18 gauge uh, brass. And brass can come in, slightly different colors. This is slightly more bronzy colored than the bright yellow. Um, and yeah, I just started using my chasing, my tracing tool or chasing tool and just start making those lines uh, with that little guy. And then I started using it, uh, drill the holes for where I wanted to make those get to those areas I needed to cut out and uh, just started working it with the, with the jeweler saw. Then after that was done, got to clean off all those burrs, um, get, rid at, well, get rid of the paper, you know, the transparency and the glue, the adhesive of what's left. And uh, yeah, just get rid of all those burrs, start cleaning it up, uh, taking the file to the edges so that those saw marks are not so evident anymore um yeah just doing all the finish work then i took to the to the dishing stump to get it to that right shape the the piece of metal already had was i already had this this steel in this shape for something else some time ago uh but it's about the right size for a pauldron so and i already had the shape i wanted it to and it's like all right cool i've already got that um so yeah, took the dishing, took the piece of dishing stump on a piece of leather so it wasn't marring up the surface. Uh, I hadn't, <clears throat> I hadn't taken it to the buffing wheel yet. 
but I still didn't want any any trans marks or transfer that I didn't want. So yeah, put the piece of leather onto it and just gently dished it to keep that to make that shape because it didn't take a whole lot. That's not a very um, it's not a very you know over the top curve and just sort of laid it in place get them and worked it again to make sure it's it's about the shape I wanted to or close to it. I even put a little bit of a ridge down the uh, down the center because the piece that I got has that yeah. so and um, then to start cleaning it up and took it to the buffing wheel. Oh, and I also gun blued the steel too because I like that contrast, that color contrast of the golden black. Me too. So <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, start buffing it out and with the buffing wheel, <laughs> and then uh, started riveting it onto onto it, and I worked it from the from the center outward rather than trying to go from the outside or some, you know, not, you know, it's, it's not a good idea to, to uh, just do it randomly because the metal can shift and deform in ways that you don't want it to where you're, while you're working it. So if I started working from the middle or sorry, from the outside and went towards the inside, I might find that it's actually puckering as it goes along to where I've got this huge space be between my, between the two metals. And now I have to like force it into place and possibly uh, deform the metal in a way I don't want it to. So in this case, I decided to work from it, from the middle outward. How did you choose which rivets to anneal? Um, this was just more like uh, just giving you an example. Okay. Um, there was no method to your madness. <laughs> well, there was a method in that I wanted to be symmetrical. Okay. So, um, so if I've got one that's annealed over here, I want its opposite to also be annealed. Same here and same here, and you know, just just give it sort of a sense of symmetry more than anything else. But in this particular in this particular case, to give an example of, okay, this is what it looks like when it's annealed. And this is what it looks what it looks like when it's not. Uh, sometimes, um, sometimes these particular escutcheon pins are harder than I want them to be. Sometimes, so I, I want them to mushroom out in a way that I would like. Um, in this particular case, it, it doesn't matter so much. I'm okay with the tone, with the surfaces not being domed. They either way, they're not they still have like a, I've still flattened the top of them at least a little bit because uh, I have not made a proper set for it so that that accommodates that dome that would keep it nice and domed. Um, if you, I would suggest doing doing that, making, making such a thing. I just haven't done it yet. Um, so yeah, rivet it together and these cushion pins, and that's what that's what the backs look like. These could be peened a little bit better. That one, that one's okay. That one's kind of okay. You can see a little bit of a lip right here where I didn't really get to it very well with uh, with the um, ball peen of the hammer. Um, and if they're not, and if they're not properly done, sometimes those edges can stick up and kind of like cut into whatever surface you put against it. So it's always nice to have them nice and clean and smooth. So I'm probably going to go to it again now that I've seen it and, and work classic. it again just a little bit more. Um, so yeah, and there's like the finished piece. Uh, the only thing it's needing right now is uh, drilling holes or riveting for whatever attachment it's going to go on to. This is meant to be like a pauldron, you know, shoulder piece kind of thing. Um, I have no idea what I'm going to do with this now. I really don't. I mean, I just I made it pretty much just for the purposes of, of this. So I don't know. I'm I, I probably won't keep it. I was going to say I'm 100 percent sure that the next time I see you in armor, it's going to be a whole new kit. 
fashioned around that. Well, I don't know. I doubt it. I mean, I'm not really that much into camels. Okay. <laughs> Although they're cool camels. They are cool. Very cool camels. They kind of look a little like elephants. A little bit. Kind of, well, yeah. I mean, well, okay. It got a little bit of a pompadour, which is what how I always think of that hair. But that's that's that that is what these camels look like in the pictures. They've yeah. got these pompadour haircuts in the, in the front. Maybe I don't know. I don't know how. What I did not know that camels would fight with each other and actually have like freaking fangs. I just thought they just had kind of wonky teeth, but. Um, this and some other depictions of two camels fighting where they're actually like biting into each other's backs with these big fangs it's just amazing uh, and kind of scary too I didn't know I already knew camels were kind of disgusting in their own way with spitting and all that but or just having bad tempers I did not know that you actually had to fear that they would you know really like you know viciously attack you they're pretty cool they are but yeah um so yeah, I don't know. Maybe I should, maybe I should like give it to uh, like someone's apprentice or something like that. Somebody who's into camels. Someone who's into camels. I don't, don't know. know. I don't know anybody into camels. I know people who are into camels. Like Angelica really likes camels, but she doesn't fight. Yeah. Yeah, she doesn't fight. Unless you would just want to like the little decorative piece of armor on herself or whatever. Have you done any rats? I have not done any rats. I don't. I don't know of any uh, depictions in my period of rats that I can think of that come to mind. He has not been so inspired. <laughs> I gotta ask. Were Were I to know the the uh, the style and aesthetic of my of my period well enough, as I said, it would be cool if if one could. It's like you know what I want to do a Scythian rat then I would, uh, hopefully I would be able to do it where it actually looks like it, it's actually from that, that kind of grave. Are you saying you like rats kill one? She's the I like to slay them. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You know, and you gotta show what you slay, right? That, yeah, that's true. That's true. true. Show off what you, yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, I, I love this. So thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. Yeah. And Is there any other? I I see. What are we like an hour? Oh, hour, but way over the hour. A little bit over the hour, so perfect timing. And it doesn't look like there's any more questions. Jed said they look like rockabilly camels. <laughs> so. Totally fair. Yeah. And totally understandable. We just came from like a weekend of of doing where rockabilly was kind of the one of the things we were doing. So I can understand that totally. Very cool. <laughs> um do you have any other questions either of you i don't yeah you I, answered my question most of my questions i would have had yeah i think you, you did a great job i have to tell you i'm super intimidated by metalwork um don't be well you every time i've tried it it hurts my hands i think i'm like what is it i'm like so stressed out about it that i grip too much um, oh okay and and it's dirty and i don't like to be dirty but i'm gonna give it a try well um I mean, you, what those chasing tools and all that? I've seen plenty of them where they people put grip will put like soft grips on them. Okay. Hugo does that. So you're yeah, I totally get you. Where you're like, oh, yeah. you're like gripping that thing so hard, uh, where you're like, you starts hurting your your fingers. Uh, but there's a way to take care of that. There's a way to to lessen that pain, or at least you know, possibly even get rid of it. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna check that out, but maybe not buy my own tools yet <laughs> like maybe go to somebody else but no. um and yeah um the this kind of stuff the pierce work is like one of the easiest entries into into this kind of thing it's it's really all it all takes is is uh, a couple of tools that you have to get like the jewelry saw um and and patience that's what I'm lacking. So I, I do actually have one more question because um, also fire sort of frightens me. So when you talk about the torch that you need, is is that like the same kind of torch that you would use for like glass beads or is it like something bigger? Well, here's something that uh, is 
um, I'm, I'm, I myself am a little bit curious about. Okay, so when people worked with glass beads, they used to use this uh, map gas, right? Yeah. But apparently that doesn't exist anymore in the way that it used to. Now they have, now I, now this, when I go to the store, if I want something hotter than just the propane, they have something there called map pro uh, gas. Um, which uh, seems to come out hotter. Uh, and I don't know what glass bead makers are working with now, but because okay. um, again, you go to, I go to the hardware store, I'm not seeing any, any map gas in the, in the, what you, the sense that it used to be. Now you, use the, you use the map pro? I'm using the map pro for annealing. All right, cool. And it just, it just, it's really fast to do. Uh, yeah, the, the regular propane bottles don't, the regular propane doesn't seem to, I mean, it'll, it'll still heat it up, but it won't give as hot of a flame. Okay. Really great. Uh, I'm, of course, I'm willing to be you know, corrected on that if someone has any technical uh, uh, details they can share. Yeah, nobody has corrected you so far, so. Um, of course, hotter, torch systems or like, you know, oxyacetylene tank stuff going on, uh, which is, again, you start getting more spendy. Whereas with a, 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 a sorry, a propane burn uh, torch or a map pro, it's like $18 for a, for a canister. Yeah, it's really accessible. Yeah, it is more accessible. Well, super cool. Thank you so much. You did so great. I know that um, teaching isn't always your thing. And I really appreciate you uh, going out of your comfort zone for me. Um, and it's been wonderful. I, I really, I know I, I, it sounds like I'm kissing your ass, but I'm really not. Um, your kit is um, the way that you always level it up. Like every Ursmus I go to, like you're wearing something new, um, is super inspiring. Um, and I appreciate you sharing your process with everyone else so that they can aspire to uh, maybe look a tenth as cool as you. <laughs> thank you. I, yeah. I actually learned a lot too. I, some of the okay. terms you used, I'm, thank you for defining them because I am totally a newbie when it comes to metalworking. Yeah. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I do not have my calendar with me, so I cannot tell you who we're talking to. Oh, I know who we're talking to this week. We're talking to Tessina from, um, from the summit, who is, I just think she's the most amazing person. She's so positive and enthusiastic and um, yeah. she's just really cool. Um, oh, but I, stop share. So anyway, so that's Wednesday and I'm not real sure who my sister's talking to on Tuesday, but um, anyway, you should tune in, so. All right. Thank you again. Bye. I really appreciate it. Everybody Thanks, have a nice guys. night. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thanks for being such wonderful hosts. Thanks. <laughs>